Hello and welcome to the American Lung Association Counting Quitting Tobacco Cessation and Quality Measures webinar. Please note today's webinar is being recorded. All participants are currently in a listen-only mode. If you would like to ask a question during the presentation, you may do so by submitting it in the Q&A box located on the right-hand side of your screen. It is now my pleasure to turn the call over to Anne. Please go ahead. Thank you, Leo, um, and thank you to everyone for joining today's webinar, Counting, Quitting, Tobacco Cessation, and Quality Measures. As Leo mentioned, my name is Anne DiGiulio. I'm the Manager of Lung Health Policy. Um, I'm joined by two of my esteemed colleagues, Rob Atset from the University of Wisconsin Center for Tobacco Research and Intervention, and Nancy Goff um, with the Oregon Health Authority. Um, and so today we're going to talk about quality measures in tobacco cessation, as the title suggests. Um, and I'm just going to quickly give everyone a brief overview um, kind of of why we're talking about this and what we consider tobacco cessation here at the Lung Association. And then um, I'm going to turn it over to the experts that we have joined with, joined with us today. Um, if you have questions, please feel free to type them into that Q&A box throughout. Um, and we will answer them at the end of the Q&A session. Um, and just to answer the first question before anybody even types it in, the webinar is being recorded and we are planning to have it up on our website hopefully by the end of this week. Um, and you should all receive a link to that after the webinar. So I'm going to quickly start by setting the stage um, and quickly going over kind of just what a comprehensive cessation benefit is. Um, and with, by the definition of a comprehensive cessation benefit, we're talking about the seven medications, which are, oops, and we went one, two, five, okay. Sorry. Seven medications, which are the five NRTs, gum patch, lozenge, nasal spray, and inhaler, bupropion, also known as Zyban, and varenicline, um, sold as the brand name Chantix. And also we consider the three forms of counseling. Um, and this is defined by the Treating Tobacco Use and Dependence, the 2008 update. Um, so this is a formal definition. In addition, there's a number of barriers that the Lung Association tracks um, and that we come across when we're looking at access to cessation. Um, and those are everything from cost sharing to um, required counseling to step care therapy, and you can see them all listed there. Um, and these really just impede um, the ability for people to access those treatments, both that counseling and the medication. So that is what we're taught, trying to get people to use. And then we know that smokers want to quit. Um, over two-thirds of smokers say they want to quit. Um, however, only half of smokers in 2015 received advice to quit from their healthcare professional um, and made a quit attempt. Um, and fewer than one in 10 smokers quit successfully. Um, and so through some of our research, especially in the Medicaid sphere, we know that most people have access to at least some medication or should have access to at least some medication because of various regulations and whatnot. Um, and we know that people want to quit. So our question today that we're hoping to kind of dig into a little bit is, how can we help, how can we increase those numbers? And I think what um, Rob and Nancy are going to talk about really is going to be a really great way to do that. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to Rob um, to talk about quality measures. Thanks, Ann. Hi, everybody. I'm Rob Adsit at the University of Wisconsin Center for Tobacco Research and Intervention. I'm happy to be with you today. Here is an overview or an outline of what I'm going to cover in about the next 20 minutes or so, um, talking first about what are performance quality measures, then next, how do they drive tobacco dependence treatment uh, interventions in healthcare settings, and then a resource or two. So here's the dictionary definition of measure, and really we're just talking about a standard uh, quality measure is a standard. It's, it's a way to compare performance, um, and in this case, performance uh, amongst healthcare providers uh, and also performance uh, amongst or across um, health systems. So it's really just the standard, uh, the benchmark. So what is a health quality measure? Uh, they, importantly, they do uh, three things. They drive care improvement, uh, they help inform consumers, and they influence payment. Um, and I'm going to talk about some of each of those uh, over the next few slides. 
But really, at the most basic, the quality measures really are a driver of the delivery and documentation of uh, timely and high quality care. And the goal really is to just consistently, you know, every patient, every clinic, every uh, healthcare site, just consistently delivering um, improved care, uh, more affordable care, and then ultimately achieving uh, improved health outcomes. Quality measures are linked to performance, uh, payment, and some, and I would say most, are incentivized at some level. Uh, most healthcare systems have a quality improvement person or staff. That would be your kind of way in. Um, they're, they're the uh, people that are tracking the quality measures and the performance of their clinicians and uh, sites across their system. And then an important point in this last bullet that uh, performance is uh, increasingly being linked to the quality of care versus the quantity of care. And that's, that's a fairly big uh, shift in healthcare over the last uh, decade or so. I want to provide just a little bit of context. I'm going to go through the national quality strategy. There's three or four slides uh, with this. I'm not going to spend a bunch of time, but this kind of sets the stage of, uh, you know, w w what universe, what world uh, do quality measures live in? And this national quality strategy um, is um, a f federal legislation, and it's really about aligning public and private sector. Uh, measures and stakeholders um, with that ultimate goal of improving health and health care. The aims, um, you've probably heard these or seen these before, better care, healthier people and healthier communities, and making health care more affordable. Next, the priorities, you can see listed here, making care safer, engaging people so they're um, partners in their health care, um, providing uh, prevention um, and treatment practices, both prevention and treatment, uh, identifying and promoting best practices, and then there's that more affordable. So uh, looking at the cost of health care and making it affordable for everyone. And then a few levers that they use. Uh, performance feedback is big. That's uh, one of the biggest uses of um, performance quality and tracking it. Um, it's a way to compare systems and clinicians. Um, it's, it's a way to set the standards that everybody uses. Uh, the reward and incentivize uh, piece is, is crucial, a uh, crucial, crucial place for leverage. Uh, and then it helps drive innovation. So best practices are, are identified and shared and um, ad adapted. Here are the five you know, core components of the national quality strategy. So here's the meat of what I'm going to talk about today. Uh, it's really how do quality measures and quality programs drive the delivery of tobacco dependence treatment? And I like starting with this slide. You can see I have, I have a little takeaway box there. Um, you know, this is, it, it kind of boils down to this. Um, what gets measured gets done. So if um, things are required, interventions, uh, treatments, prevention are required to be documented and measured and reported, um, that drives uh, clinician behavior and health system behavior. And the, the second bullet's a little more cynical, um, and that is what gets paid for gets done. Um, and reimbursement um, is, is a big driver of uh, services, clinical services, and their delivery. Um, and then the uh, incentive that I'm going to talk about uh, in some detail in the next few slides uh, really um, also help drive. So this is really the core of um, how quality measures um, influence behavior and drive health, the health care that's delivered. 
I'm sure you're all familiar with the Affordable Care Act, better care, smarter spending, healthier people. Uh, another key piece is um, this, this idea of clinical decision support, so using the electronic health record to give clinicians the information they need at the moment they need it. So the, the theory of this just in time so that they've got uh, what they need in front of them for the patient that is uh, standing there in their exam room. And then, as I said earlier, um, rewarding value or quality of care uh, versus the volume or quantity of care. That's, that's, that's been a pretty major shift that is attributable to the Affordable Care Act. Here are the tobacco cessation components uh, from the Affordable Care Act. <clears throat> the uh, USPSTF uh, A and B preventive services, and that includes tobacco cessation, um, that has an A from USPSTF. Uh, health insurance premiums can be up to one and a half times higher for um, tobacco users. Uh, there's a set of what's called essential health benefits uh, that must be covered, and that includes tobacco cessation treatment, uh, elimination of coverage for certain meds, um, basically uh, have to cover all seven FDA-approved tobacco cessation medications, and then uh, coverage for uh, treatment for pregnant Medicaid members. Um, the Departments of Labor, Health and Human Services, and the Treasury Department uh, released, uh, issued some guidance in 2014, uh, people to just give some clarity about what does it mean for a health plan or an insurer to uh, be in compliance with the Affordable Care Act um, information about tobacco cessation that I just talked about. And here's, here's what, the, uh, what they issued, um, that all, tobacco, all patients would be screened for tobacco use, and those who are using tobacco products, uh, coverage for at least two cessation attempts per year, and those, each of those attempts includes at least four tobacco cessation counseling of 10 minutes each, and then, again, all seven FDA-approved tobacco cessation medications. And ALA um, and uh, other partners <laughs> um, have found that that is not uh, being done universally across the country. A really big component of the Affordable Care Act is meaningful use, and it's an incentives and penalties. It provides incentives and penalties to providers and hospitals to meaningfully use. Uh, their electronic health records, and I'll, I'll talk about that a bit, but uh, why does meaningful use matter? It's really the standard that um, almost all doctors and hospitals um, are now using, and uh, they need to deliver the care, document the care, and report the care to uh, the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services, CMS, in order to receive these incentive payments. Uh, it's really the federal government's roadmap. It's what's driving um, all of this type of work, uh, health information technology and health information exchange at the national and federal level. And it's also a major influencers, uh, uh, influencer of activities of healthcare and especially EHR vendors as they uh, develop and enhance their products. So here's... Uh, some data on, you know, again, why it's such uh, meaningful use has been such a big deal. Um, it began in 2011, so we're about six years in. But over 500,000 eligible professionals, so clinicians, are participating, and almost 5,000 hospitals are participating across the United States. And then it's a huge economic driver. Um, this is, these are the um, incentive payments. And this is in billions of dollars, billions with a B. Uh, so through April of this year, uh, eligible, eligible professionals, so these, this group of clinicians, um, have uh, received $15 billion in incentive payments through Meaningful Use, and hospitals have received $21 billion. So it's, it's, 
it's a big deal uh, incentive-wise. And it's really uh, what's driven the, uh, it's, it's accelerated the adoption of electronic health records and the technology. So here in uh, kind of one uh, graph are the smoking and tobacco use elements of the Meaningful Use Program. Uh, starting out, it's recording smoking status, uh, and at the beginning it was for more than 50% of your patients, and then the next stage was more than 80%. Um, stage three is still in the proposed, and I'm going to talk about what uh, some people are saying is probably the next, what, what will become stage three. Um, and then at the bottom are the clinical quality measures, um, and tobacco cessation is one of the nine recommended uh, for uh, eligible professionals, professionals, and you can see the measure there at the bottom of the slide. And this slide shows you that it, uh, meaningful use really has driven um, and changed, uh, increased the performance around recording smoking status. And honestly, um, this is through 2014. Um, it, it's, uh, smoking status is almost universally um, documented in the electronic health records now across the country. So here's uh, what some people think um, meaningful use is kind of the next phase of it. Um, and it's part of the MACRA, uh, which is the Medicare Access and CHIP Reauthorization Act of 2015. So lots of acronyms, um, lots of uh, long titles. But basically what this does is within the Medicare program, there are two tracks, uh, the merit-based incentive payment system, and you can see there that it's consolidating um, three existing programs, and then the alternative payment models, and that gives additional incentive payments um, to provide high quality and cost efficient care. Um, and again, the Medicare payment adjustments are based on the performance and the tobacco uh, use screening and intervention um, measure is part of uh, each of these programs. So again, this could probably, MACRA could be a webinar all on its own. It's brand new. It just was implemented uh, January 1st of this year, um, and it's it's a good indicator of where the federal um, uh, quality programs um, are likely headed. Uh, but for now, this is for Medicare uh, providers and about the incentives and payment through Medicare. So I'm going to tick through a bunch of other um, quality programs um, in a fairly quick fashion. Uh, the first is on the inpatient side, so the Joint Commission uh, credits uh, almost all of the hospitals in the United States, and they, in 2012, um, uh, changed, upgraded their tobacco performance measure set, and here's what that set looks like, again, implemented starting January 1st of 2012 for inpatient hospital settings, um, screening for tobacco use, providing tobacco use treatment, including counseling and meds during the hospitalization, and then providing a plan for continuing that tobacco cessation or that quit attempt um, at discharge and that it becomes part of their discharge plan. Um, I will, oh, I'll talk about a, a few more details about that. Um, in this next program, which is uh, CMS's inpatient prospective payment system. And you'll see on most of these slides, I do have links. Um, so again, this could be a webinar all on its own, but um, I've given you links uh, if you want to dig in deeper on any of these programs. Um, so IPPS is a quality reporting mechanism and CMS uses it to incentivize or um, penalize performance um, around a specific set of uh, quality measures. 
And um, fortunately for us, uh, tobacco cessation um, is, has been the Joint Commission uh, measures have been adopted uh, only f at this point for inpatient psychiatric facilities. And um, we are working towards uh, having CMS, getting CMS to um, add the Joint Commission measures to the, for the general hospitals. Um, and at this point, it probably, it's looking like the first two Joint Commission measures are um, heading toward being approved for inclusion in the IPPS for general hospitals. And this really drives behavior because it's um, completely tied to the reimbursement that um, hospitals get from CMS. So again, it's one of those things about what gets paid for gets done. The National Quality Forum is an important player in the um, quality field. Uh, they really are the uh, agency that um, uh, reviews and recommends um, the standardized performance measures. And um, almost universally, without NQF endorsement, uh, it's very difficult for a, quality, a new quality measure to be considered uh, for any of the um, different quality programs that we're covering today. Uh, here is the, the uh, basic, the t tobacco quality measure, and it's number 0028. It is um, used in almost, you know, this is the one tobacco measure that's used almost universally across many uh, quality programs. You can see a, a list there in the third bullet. Um, but again, it's, um, it's been around for a while. It's been um, fairly consistent over the years. Um, and it's kind of the standard, um, considered the standard in tobacco um, cessation quality measures. Next, I just want to touch upon quickly the um, U.S. Preventive Services Task Force. Uh, they have uh, given tobacco use identification and cessation intervention treatments uh, a recommendation of A in uh, 2015. And here is a summary of that recommendation. Um, and I'm, again, won't go through the details, but it's basically providing counseling and medication. And uh, USPSTF stands on evidence. They do a, an exhaustive review of the literature. And um, as you all know, um, the combination of medication plus counseling is uh, what gives people the most chance to have a successful quit attempt. Uh, next, uh, the National Committee for Quality Assurance, NCQA, another acronym. Uh, and this includes the HEDIS measures and the CAPS measures. And HEDIS is Healthcare Effectiveness Data and Information Set. And CAPS is Consumer Assessment of Healthcare Providers and Systems. Uh, and as you can probably tell from the titles, HEDIS is um, uh, reported by clinicians, and um, CAPS is actually consumers, a, a, a survey of consumers about their experience with healthcare. And I've got the HEDIS tobacco use measure there at the bottom. It's uh, pretty much identical to the NQF 0028 that I showed on the previous slide from National Quality Form. So just to wrap up, um, the federal regulatory and payment um, systems are uh, really evolving rapidly. They're incredibly dynamic. You hear about them, and you hear about some of them in the news every day. Um, you know what what will happen with the Affordable Care Act is um, kind of top of mind at the federal level these days. Uh, so. With that said, um, while things might change, like the terminology and the nomenclature, um, 
the goals are probably going to remain pretty constant, and that's improving the quality of care, improving care coordination, engaging patients in their care, improving population and public health, um, and more affordable care. And then while I also sum up with while every healthcare, almost every healthcare system, clinic, hospital universally asks and documents about tobacco use, um, among those who are identified as tobacco users, a much smaller proportion um, are receiving an actual evidence-based intervention. And then finally, I'm going to end with a resource slide. Um, you can see that I've got down the rabbit hole here. These are links to pretty much all of the quality programs um, that I've covered today, along with some other details like lists of electronic clinical quality measures, uh, that kind of thing. Um, so any of you that want to take a deep dive um, and really dig into this stuff, there are links to the major programs right here. And I will conclude with our website. We've got resources there. And thank everybody and turn it back to Ann. Thanks, Rob. Um, that was a really great and very in-depth overview. Um, and um, we are trying to figure out how to best get the slides to everybody. So, um, and with that, so don't worry about those links. Um, and there's an email address at the end, so feel free to email me if you've got any questions or concerns. Um, additionally, now it is my pleasure to turn it over to Nancy Goff, who's going to talk a little bit about um, Oregon's experience with their Medicaid program and using some um, metrics there. So, Nancy. Hi, thank you for having me on the webinar. My name is Nancy Goff, and I'm a health systems policy specialist in the health promotion and chronic disease prevention section at the Public Health Division um, in Oregon at the Oregon Health Authority. Um, and so today I wanted to talk briefly about Oregon's tobacco incentive metric. So let me see if I can advance these slides. Looks like I'm not able to. Um, Nancy, do you want to say next slide and I can advance them for you? Yeah, that would be great. Thanks. Um, so we can go ahead to the next slide. And I'm actually going to skip over this one and go to the next one. OK, great. Um, so like many states, Oregon's gone through a health system transformation in the last few years. Um, so we now have CCOs, or Coordinated Care Organizations. Um, some states call them MCOs or ACOs, but essentially our CCOs implement and deliver the Oregon Health Plan, which is our statewide Medicaid plan. Um, and CCO, the CCO model is kind of made possible, possible by Oregon's um, 1115 Medicaid waiver that allows Oregon to test out a new model for Medicaid delivery. And the CCOs were stood up through state legislation um, in 2012. So we've had the waiver in Oregon for much longer than that um, to test out some, some different delivery models. Um, but the CCO model came about um, in 2012. So like many um, health systems transformations, the CCOs really attempt to address some of the issues of fragmented care and funding streams, like Rob was just talking about, um, and connecting healthcare services with outcomes, integrating local participation. There's a real um, focus in Oregon on having local control over, over issues in, in communities. So this really helps to address that. Um, accountability, like Rob talked about as well, and governance um, of our Medicaid delivery model. And finally, the incentives that CCOs need to meet, um, which I'll talk about today. That'll be the focus of this talk. Um, provide incentives for them to increase their quality in order to shift the, the system to pro promote better outcomes. So currently, um, our CCOs cover uh, 1 million Oregonians, which is about 25% of the Oregon population. And you can go on to the next slide. So this is a map of our CCO delivery areas in Oregon. So you can see there are 16 of them which is quite a lot. Um, if you think about each CCO as, as a payer um, and add that to the mix of all the other healthcare payers in Oregon, um, it's still a pretty diverse um, system. Um, so they're, they're uh, again, like I said, um, each CCO has local control over the issues that they're looking at. Um, 
HCCO is required to have a community advisory council, which is made up of folks that um, work at the CCO, local public health folks, but also people that receive care from HCCO. So they're really grounded in um, the local communities here in Oregon. Next slide. Um, so how do the, the quality incentive measures work? So um, CCOs have 18 quality incentive measures um, that they need to address each year. Um, they must meet a benchmark or improvement target in 13 of those 18 measures and also have at least 60% enrollment in a primary care home among their membership in order to meet, um, in order to receive their quality pool payments. Um, so the, the 2016 quality pool is $179 million statewide or 4.25-ish percent of the previous year's budget. This is, <clears throat> excuse me, this is the fourth year that um, CCOs are reporting on their metrics and receiving quality payments. And we are seeing improvements. The system is really key in shifting the Medicaid system towards rewarding health outcomes. Um, of the atrium metrics, I've listed a few on the slide that are relevant to our work here in the health promotion and chronic disease section at the state. Um, you can see some of the other ones aside from tobacco, um, colorectal cancer screening, controlling high blood pressure, diabetes control, um, screening for alcohol or other substances, tobacco prevalence, and um, obesity as well. So obesity is one that's in development. It's likely that it will be rolled out in the next two years. Um, it's not currently one of the incentive metrics that CCOs have, but we are working um, with our uh, state Medicaid office to think about what that might look like. Um, the tobacco metric is actually new this year. They just reported on it for the first time less than a month ago, so I'm actually excited to share with you um, some very new information that just was just published last month about calendar year 16 performance. So you can go on to the next slide. Um, so the tobacco metric for CCOs is a bundled metric, which means that it has three parts. So these are the three components that need to be in place for a CCO to receive their incentive payment. So the first one is that they need to meet the minimum benefit requirements. That's, that's called the cessation benefit floor. And um, I'll talk about this a little bit more in the next slide, but these requirements are aligned with a lot of the things that Rob talked about already in terms of the ACA requirements, the USPSTF um, guidelines, um, and other things as well. Um, the second component is that they need to submit EHR-based cigarette smoking and tobacco prevalence data according to data submission requirements. So a piece of it is really just um, making sure that CCOs um, have that capacity to submit that EHR data and getting that system in place, that tracking system. And then the third component is that they'll meet a benchmark or improvement target established by Oregon Health Authorities, that's the Medicaid agencies, Metrics and Scoring Committee, which is the committee that oversees the, the metrics. Okay, next slide. Okay, so just a little bit of note about the policy context that supports implementation of this metric in Oregon, which has really been crucial um, to its success. So um, Rob talked a little bit about the national guidelines, but in Oregon for a CCO, there are really three requirements around um, tobacco cessation. So the first is that piece of the ACA um, that requires insurers to provide coverage. Um, so that applies here as well. The second, um, Apologies for an acronym in there that is not spelled out, but the HERC is the Health Evidence Review Commission. And this is the, uh, an or state Oregon committee that reviews medical evidence in order to provide um, prioritized health spending in the Oregon Health Plan. So they, they govern decisions about Medicaid spending in Oregon. Um, they, they determine um, what, what is covered for physical health and dental health services through what they call the prioritized list. They make a list of services that um, very high priority services that will have a big impact on health outcomes are at the top and then lower priority ones at the bottom. Um, and there are somewhere in the realm of 400 or 500 things on the list. Um, tobacco use um, and cessation is very high up on the list, so it's a higher priority. 
um, on that list. And, and the HERC says on their prioritized list that comprehensive tobacco cessation benefits need to be covered for Medicaid members in alignment with the ACA guidelines. Um, and the HERC has also some other guidance around tobacco that will help support CCOs in meeting this metric um, in, and reducing tobacco prevalence use over time. Um, and these things are called um, guidance documents for multi-sector interventions. And I'm going to talk a little bit more about that later because it's, it's slightly different, but it sort of helps um, CCOs to meet that prevalence metric. And finally, the third bullet on this slide um, is the metric itself. So in order to receive their incentive payment, it is a component of that bundled metric that they do need to have the gold standard and cessation benefits. Um, so there, there's an incentive for both improving access um, to cessation through the metric, but also um, because it requires a decrease in tobacco use prevalence over time, um, there's an incentive to create a system that ensures that on, not only do people have benefits, but that you're looking at um, some of the other strategies that really help to drive down tobacco use rates. So next slide, please. So the next three slides show data from the, the first year um, that CCOs have been collecting information and reporting on the tobacco um, use metric um, for calendar year 2016. Um, so this slide shows the way that the scores are calculated. And I really just put this up here for reference. We can kind of move quickly um, through these slides. But um, you can see that as a phasing in of the metric, um, those three components are weighted in calculating the score. And the weighting of reductions in prevalence goes up over time in order to give CCOs a fair shot at implementing this metric. You can also see on this slide that 15 of the 16 CCOs received their incentive payment this year for tobacco. And next slide. Here's the information, if you're interested, broken down by CCO um, about the different components of their metric and how the scores were calculated. And then next slide, here's the information broken down by CCO for prevalence. So you can see a variation in tobacco use rates um, by CCO, um, and you can also see um, a variation in cigarette smoking rates across the geographic regions of the state. Next slide. So now I wanted to talk a little bit about the work that we do in health promotion and chronic disease prevention, or as we call ourselves, HIPCADIP for the acronym, um, to support CCOs in implementing these benefits and the metrics. So, um, we are part of the same agency as the Medicaid, state Medicaid agency in public health. Um, we're just in a different section. So that really helps our collaboration um, on some of these areas. So our, our section as a whole, our, the HIPCADIP section, works mostly on policy systems and environmental change strategies to impact the risk factors that are listed here, which are the largest um, preventable causes of death in Oregon. So we work on alcohol, tobacco, physical activity, and nutrition. And we really try to prioritize strategies that are evidence-based um, and that, that will help us make, uh, move the needle on improving health in these areas um, and the chronic diseases that they lead to um, with very limited resources. We also focus um, our, our limited resources on populations that are experiencing disparities, and working with CCOs and the Medicaid population really helps us to achieve that in the area of tobacco. Um, and this is interesting, you know, for public health because we know that cessation is one piece of a larger system that will help drive down tobacco use over time. And we are lucky to work in the tobacco field, I feel, because there's this huge evidence base, you know, 9,000 or so studies um, about what works, so we know what works now. Um, and so I've included some of the, the strategies that we use to guide our work on this slide, of which, you know, cessation is one piece, and it's one important piece, but it's really just one piece of a larger system. Um, and I, on the slide, you can see that these areas are, you know, making sure that tobacco is expensive, making sure cessation is free, creating tobacco-free environments, and limiting the places where tobacco is sold. Um, and we just had a huge success in our state um, for raising the 
the, the age for purchasing tobacco to 21. Um, our legislature adjourned this past Monday, and that was a huge success of our, our legislative session. So we're going to be the, the third state in the country to have um, uh, an age of purchasing tobacco of 21. Um, so, that, so that just gives you an example of some of the other areas that we're working on to create the system that will help CCOs um, meet their metrics. Um, so you can go on to the next slide. And here's a, a little bit more of some of the things that I was just discussing, but here are some of the specific ways that we accomplish this work. Um, we provide guidance and technical assistance on metrics creation and implementation to our state Medicaid office. Um, we work to make sure that that full benefits coverage um, is available to, to um, all people in the state of Oregon. Um, so, you know, we work with health systems to make sure that they've got the benefits that are required under the ACA and the HERC, but we also um, provide cessation services for uninsured through our, our statewide quit line. We also will work to build bridges at the local level, so we encourage our local public health departments and to work with their, their CCOs so that um, the CCOs can have support in um, implementing those benefits. And we have a network of, of local um, tobacco prevention and education grantees in every county, um, and it, as a part of their work plan, they're required to work with their CCO and provide that technical assistance on implementing the benefits in, and in order to achieve their metric. Um, and as I mentioned, we also work, we have policy and systems change work that targets um, inequities in, in health status. Um, at the local level, um, I just mentioned the tobacco prevention and education grants, but we also have another grant, pro we have two other grant programs, but the, the one that's most relevant to this one, um, this work is called the SEARCH program, and that stands for Sustainable Relationships for Community Health. Um, and you can actually go on to the, to the next slide. And the next slide. Okay, here's a little bit more about the search program. Um, so this program in its, is in its third year right now, and it involves three highly facilitated institutes over the course of a year um, for a coalition of folks that is made up of CCOs, local public health agencies, clinics, and community partners. And teams do pick a topic or two in an area and um, a lot of them do focus on tobacco so that they can make, um, work together to make improvements in systems that will be sustained beyond the course of the grant. So they make uh, some short and long-term plans together. They discuss best practices, quality improvement, system changes, um, how do they change their workflows, um, and a lot of this really helps CCOs in, in meeting that metric. So next slide. So um, a little bit more I, I wanted to say about um, the larger context of um, tobacco prevention and education that contributes to um, folks meeting the metrics. So before I mentioned the HERC, the Health Evidence Review Commission, and their guidelines for state Medicaid policy, um, the Oregon List of Prioritized Services, um, which I mentioned before, it um, determines what's covered under Medicaid, ad addresses tobacco in two places. Um, so this language is actually taken directly from the HERC guidelines, and this is aligned with the ACA um, required benefits. And there's some specific language about pregnant women as well. And go on to the next slide. And the second place that um, the HERC talks about tobacco is through the multi-sector interventions. And this is really an area that encourages health systems to use strategies like tobacco taxes to reduce tobacco prevalence. Um, and there, there are some links, again, this is directly from the guidance, um, that take you to um, some of our resources, but also to the Community Preventive Services Task Force, um, what works for tobacco, and you can go to the next slide. And you can see that this, which is taken from um, the community guide, this graphic right here, um, is part of the guidance um, so that folks that are implementing um, Medicaid can think about some of the other things that may help in, um, in reducing tobacco prevalence statewide and also helping CCOs to meet their metric. So a lot of our work is focused, again, on um, putting all these pieces in place so that there's a system for tobacco um, prevention and education 
of which cessation is one piece. But having these incentive metrics at CCOs has really helped us um, to push for this comprehensive system that will reduce tobacco prevalence over time. So um, next slide, please. So this is my contact information. If anyone has any questions for me outside of the webinar, feel free to give me a call or email me, and I'd be happy to talk more about our work here. So thank you. Thank you, Nancy. That was great. It's really awesome to see what is happening in Oregon here. Let me put Nancy's contact information up for one more minute. Um, so right now we're going to have, we've got a few minutes left for questions. Um, we are going to do questions just through the Q&A box. So if you have a question, um, please feel free to type it in. Um, we do have a couple questions that are in already, so I can start. Um, and so somebody asked that acknowledge that the recording will be available, and we are making that available, um, and asked about the PowerPoint slides, um, and we are planning to make those available as well in a PDF form. Um, so if you have any problems, um, once you get the follow-up email, please feel free to contact me. Um, I believe my email address is on there, or one of them is on there. Um, so we're going to have questions now. Um, additionally, in that follow-up email, we're asking everyone if you could take a couple moments to please um, fill out a survey just on the webinar. Um, we want to make sure that, from the Long Association's perspective, that we are making, we're making sure there's content that um, is helpful and useful to everybody in their work. So we've got a question from Leslie, um, and it's about MACRA. So I think probably Rob, but the question is, is MACRA only for Medicare, or will it include Medicaid at a later date? Yeah, hi, that's a great question. Um, at this point, it is just Medicare, um, and uh, providers have to have a certain percentage of their patients that are Medicare um, to be, you know, enroll in the program. So for now, it's just Medicare. But also, um, and, it's a very okay. new program. It's, you know, a few months old, so um, with all the stuff that is happening and changing, um, you know, stay tuned, I guess. <laughs> Great. Um, Rob, I just want a quick follow-up question for that. Um, so if it's only, if MACRA is only available for Medicaid, Medicare, excuse me, um, how does that influence providers that, does that influence providers that don't really take that many Medicaid, Medicare patients? Um, it doesn't. Um, and you probably would, the next uh, logical question is, what about the Medicaid? So, you know, meaningful use um, right now is for Medicare and Medicaid um, providers. And again, with um, stage three of meaningful use, that is for both Medicaid and Medicare is still um, suspended. Uh, and probably uh, we won't know much more detail until um, some of the federal action happens and see where that settles out. Great, thanks. Um, so we've got a question to kind of clarify from Karen. Um, at the beginning of the program, Ann mentioned that only 10% of current smokers on Medicaid receive benefits. The cessation benefits, um, are we still measuring how many were offered medications? Um, Karen, so I can answer that question. Um, what I was referring to is a recent MMWR study. I want to say it was from December, so six months old. Um, or no, not that one. I'm, the 10% on Medicaid refers to a study that um, Dr. Leighton Koo did um, maybe about a year ago where he looked at um, the number of patients that were receiving prescriptions for cessation medications. Um, we're measuring how many medications are, the Lung Association measures what Medicaid programs cover what medications. Um, we don't we don't have a comprehensive way to track utilization yet, um, but Dr. Koo did some work on that, and I'm happy if you feel free to email me. I will put my email address up because that's the next slide. Um, if you have any questions, and I can you know give you some more details from that study. We had another question about clarification with coverage of group counseling. Um, and so I think that probably refers to some of the ACA requirements. Um, and again, all um, private, most private insurance plans, any plans currently sold on the exchanges, and um, any Medicaid expansion plan um, has to cover the um, USPSTF benefits that Rob and Nancy both talked about. 
Um, and that, that includes um, both group counseling, individual counseling, and phone counseling. It should be four sessions each, um, and that should be available at least twice a year. Um, we know from some research we've done that not all plans seem to be covering that, um, but that's always a fluid and moving target. So again, anybody else with questions, please feel free to type them into the question box. I know that was a lot of information, um, so I'm sure people are still trying to process it. Bob or Nancy, if you guys have questions for each other, please feel free to chime in as well. Rob, I would just say congratulations to Oregon for the uh, age 21. Yeah. Yeah, thank you. Congratulations, yeah. Yeah, people are definitely celebrating here. <laughs> Good. Okay, well with that, Leah, why don't we end the webinar, um, and we will be sending out a follow-up email, so if you have a minute, please feel free, please encourage you to take the survey, and thank you so much for joining, um, and feel free to send the recording to your friends and colleagues. So thank you so much. Thank you. This does conclude Counting, Quitting, Tobacco Cessation, and Quality Measures webinar. You may now disconnect your lines, and everyone have a great day.